Okay, hello, um, I'm Kerry Binding from the University of South Wales. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, data integration in the context of uh, uh, a data integration case study project we did towards the end of the Ariadne project, which was taking a number of uh, archaeological data sets and modeling them in, in detail uh, and pulling the data together. And, and I put multilingual here in brackets because there was a multilingual angle to what we were doing and pulling the data together. I'm going to talk a bit about some of the problems we came up against in pulling the data together into a common platform and searching right across it. So the goal of data integration, as I said, was, was to create a set of interoperable data to achieve multilingual cross-search. And some of the potential obstacles we might uh, encounter when we're trying to do that because we're dealing with data that's coming from different cultures, different languages. Uh, so you've got a lot of different words to start with that mean the same thing, but obviously are um, uh, expressed differently. Um, the data may have been created under different organizational standards, uh, different conventions and policies, and is plainly going to have data different data structures um, applied to it. Um, it could be coming from a variety of different technologies, um, if it's coming in in a binary format, we're going to have to deal with that. And you use the data types, and there's significant limitations to some data types used in popular uh, databases, for instance. I'll show a few examples of that. Uh, there may be different units of measurement. Quite often, uh, I found that where the measurements in uh, data sets, the, the unit wasn't explicitly specified. It was just assumed that you knew what it was. And so the data wasn't really self-describing. You had to go elsewhere to find out what was meant. Uh, and there could be different levels of granularity between different data sets. Somebody could be talking in terms of, of dates down to the, to the nearest month or the nearest year, um, or date spans, or named periods or eons or something. Um, and just the simple um, instances of just using different words to describe the same things can, can frustrate if you're trying to cross search this data. And I'll, cover a few ways that we can get around that. And so data cleansing and data alignment is, is usually the things that are required to uh, resolve some of these issues. There's some particular complications we came across in terms of uh, user dates. Um, there, there seems to be a whole variety of ways to express dates, notwithstanding all the, the multilingual issues. Uh, for instance, there, there are issues between uh, data ex expressed using different calendars. You see that countries switched over from the Julian to Gregorian calendar at different times, and there was a point in time where um, much of Europe was on one calendar and Britain was on another. So it could be possible for a vessel to leave one port and arrive before they departed, according to the dates in the log. And so there's a note of caution there if you're using dates that have been transcribed from historical documents, because the date that they meant may not necessarily be the date that you mean on your um, chronological time span. And the problems might not be obvious if that data has been divorced from its original context and you're trying to reuse it in a, in a different uh, way. If we're going down to particular dates, um, the year used to start at different points in time um, according to uh, when, when, uh, when it was happening. Um, so we used to use the, the Roman year start and then we changed to starting the year in terms of Christian festivals. Um, Scotland decided to change back to using the 1st of January as the start of the year in a different time to when England started to uh, use it. And you, you, you had dates that were expressed as two different years for, for certain points in time. So you might have 20th of January, 1748-9. And that doesn't mean an approximate date. It means that it's the, um, the civil year and the historical year different at the start of the year. And sometimes signified old style or new style. Years. And you can see it on gravestones from certain points in time where they've got um, two different dates for the, uh, for the death, possibly. I mentioned there were some uh, technical limitations uh, for dates, uh, for, for any data types. Uh, that there are um, limitations on the, the, um, the span of, of information you can put into any particular data type. And um, particularly with dates, there were things that I didn't quite realize. Um, I knew about them from, from the point of view of some of the programming languages. 
But uh, for instance, the databases, the data types that they use to describe dates are very limited if you want to put in archaeological data uh, where we want to have uh, much wider date spans, perhaps. And so you can see there's uh, very specific dates for the minimums there for, for Oracle and Postgres. Um, SQL Server date time um, didn't handle any dates before the switch to the Gregorian calendar to avoid um, because we lost was it 10 or 12 days when they switched over from one calendar to the other. People were up in arms that they lost these days. Um, but it makes it difficult to calculate the difference in terms of, of a date span if you go past that, that, uh, that limitation. So, so um, SQL Server just uh, didn't handle it at all. Um, and, and you've got similar uh, problems with uh, programming languages, Java, JavaScript, Access and Excel handle things in different ways. Um, and so you can see that there's lots of, lots of issues in terms of how you're going to uh, handle the data. So if you're going to take all this data and put it into a, another system again and try to in integrate it, the choice of what you use um, to handle dates in particular is going to, going to be influenced by, by these limitations. And so we need different ways of doing that. And there are standard uh, ways of representing <coughs> dates in strings where you don't have those, those numeric limitations. Uh, the ISO 8601 standard is used for this. Uh, you, you, these are quite familiar to people who use XML and XSD data types. You can see it's a, there's a, what they call a seven property model, year, month, day, hour, minute, second, and time zone in a, in a kind of structured string. And you can uh, express data in a, in a standard way using those. Uh, but the, the standard doesn't accommodate named periods, which is the kind of thing we quite often find uh, in uh, data sets, like Georgian or the Iron Age, and these are kind of spatial temporal con concepts, which have a bit more inbuilt meaning, and we need to, to express exactly what we mean about those. Um, otherwise, in the course of time, in 50 years' time, nobody's going to understand exactly what we meant when we said it. Um, and I thought century boundaries were pretty straightforward. Um, there was no year zero, so century started year one, ended year 100, that's what I thought. Um, Wikidata kind of says that, uh, so they, they, they've got 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th century, etc. entities specifically for them. Uh, but then they, they have a, uh, a whole part relationship with uh, decades, and they have a decade in them that doesn't match what they say that the, the overall uh, thing starts and ends with. Uh, Getty AAT kind of remain on the, on the fence in terms of when centuries start and end, and they just say both of them. So they say uh, the 15th century is a century in the Gregorian calendar, including the years 1400 to 1499, or 1401 to 1500. So we'll cover both there. Um, so when, when do we think the end of the second millennium or the 20th century was? Well, we all partied like it was 1999, didn't we? So <laughs> I think we got it wrong. Um, <laughs> uh, we talked about the millennium bug, but that was going to that was going to really cause problems between ninety nine and two thousand. So again, it wasn't really the millennium bug, was it? It was just before. Um, and we we quite often come across in, in date spans that are, that are um, in data sets they have prefixes and suffixes attached to them to to vary what they actually mean. And so they may say early or earlier or late or later. And we need to define what that means. And it may mean different things to different people. And try to isolate what that means so that we can, if we want to search across the data, we need to really resolve all of these things down to date spans. <coughs> and if we don't know what early means, then we're going to have to try and make something out. Uh, we were dealing, as I mentioned, with multilingual stuff. Um, so you've got a variety of different ways of expressing um, names of centuries, for instance. Um, I, I tried to go to Wikidata to try and illuminate uh, or get, get some examples of this. They've got lots of different uh, variants in different languages for these concepts. Um, but you can see where, where they, on the right hand side there, where they um, talk about AD in different languages. They seem to have got it wrong. They've got French there with, with Avon, which I think is uh, before, if my schoolboy French is any 
anything to go by. So um, you can't really just rely on these online resources as being accurate. You need, you need somebody who knows what they're talking about in terms of uh, native speakers of the language, preferably. Uh, we went through a process of identifying um, things which were potential date spans in text using a sequence of uh, regular expression patterns. So we could identify things where, where there were four digits followed by a hyphen, followed by a couple of digits. Um, they may be followed by something like AD or BC or CD or any of those variants. And in different languages, of course, those things are different. So you may have sort of Roman numerals and then the name of the word for century, a different, different kind of pattern there. So we, we uh, created a bit of software which did this kind of thing using a library of different patterns which were likely textual phrases which describe date, dates or date spans. Um, we used a few rules to filter out some of the obvious things which would be inapplicable. Um, and then the important thing then is to determine what would be meant in terms of comparable dates. You can see that, that first example there, 1484 to 6. What does that mean? It doesn't mean from the year 6 to the year 1484. Uh, so you've got to take into account uh, if you've matched that pattern, then it's likely to mean this. <clears throat> and then after that, we need to serialize that information into some sort of standard interchange format using those dates so we can search across the data effectively. And so there, on the right-hand side, uh, you probably can't read that very well. There's a few of the example results that we were getting out of this um, system. We, call it, we created a small utility application which did bulk processing of tabular data. Um, and it's, it asserts start and end dates for these time span patterns that we were finding um, based on, on a bit of knowledge that we gave it. Um, where there were named periods, obviously there's no, there's no evidence in that to, to link it to numeric numbers, so we had to have a look up table of what we thought those things meant. Um, it's all a bit of a work in progress. Uh, we, we've got some coverage for multilingual patterns, but uh, of course I'm, I'm not a native speaker of other languages, so it needs some input from the native speakers to confirm the most common ways that they express date spans in each language. We've had some input from some French people and some uh, Italian people uh, on, on how those things work. And so we were able to create example um, patterns which, which accommodated those, those types of things. Uh, other, other kinds of data cleansing as well as dates, um, if, you, if you're dealing with um, subject metadata or something like that. Um, anything, anything where there's been free text data entry almost inevitably is going to introduce issues. Um, I mean, here is an example which will remain uh, anonymous. That we came across this. There are 47 variants of one word, which I think is, is quite impressive. Really. Uh, and sometimes they're errors, but sometimes they're intentional. You can, you can see, uh, well, you can not quite see, but there are indicators of uncertainty. Yeah, they, they put the question mark there for a reason. It's not a spelling mistake. Um, so we can refine these. Uh, I've, I've used a, a tool there called Open Refine, which uh, kind of clusters things which they think are, are variants of the same word. And so you can resolve them all to the same word. And that helps. Uh, but you've got to deal with what they meant by that uncertainty and whether you want to record that in your data going forward as well. <clears throat> we also did a bit of work on extending the entry vocabulary of the existing thesauri. Um, they tended to not have a very comprehensive entry vocabulary um, and we wanted to cover singular or plural or adjectival forms of terms to try to uh, uh, locate them because quite often you can't match the exact term that they say is the preferred term in the thesaurus it's not quite used in that way in the data set. Um, so you could enumerate all the possibilities as, as part of the entry vocabulary. You could reduce them all to a common word stem in that example there or you could use some sort of regular expression pattern which can um, pick up all the different uh, variants a bit more accurately. Uh, the stemming seems the most uh, um, simple, easy way to do it, but um, it's, it's not always going to work. Uh, for instance, in Celtic languages like uh, Welsh, you can have uh, mutations for the start of the word, depending on the context of the words being used in, and so you're not going to find it through using a stemming uh, approach. But you can use it, you, uh, as I say, a, a regular expression pattern like that. You can accommodate those different variants. Um, but once we've clean, cleansed that data, what does it actually mean? Um, do, have we documented the meaning of that data in some way? Um, and having done that, will our colleagues understand what was meant 
may I be not run over by a bus tomorrow? Does everyone know what we meant when we say a particular rule in the data set? Um, could people from another organization understand what was meant? Could people from another domain understand what we meant? Uh, will people in different countries understand what we meant? Could anyone in 50 years' time understand what on earth we, we meant at the time? So I think if we can answer some of those questions, or at least work towards it, we can create more integrated, interoperable data. Because um, I know there's a tendency to, to just delegate some of these issues to somebody else in the future. But that's me at the moment, because I'm coming across these legacy data sets from the past and trying to, trying to deal with it. Uh, so maybe we shouldn't use words at all to index data records. Uh, why not? Well, words are ambiguous. If we use words in our indexing, the indexing becomes ambiguous. And if we use words in our searching, the search criteria we're using are ambiguous. So here I've got a little search on Paris, and I found the Wikipedia page about Paris and the Eiffel Tower. Have I found what I was looking for? Who knows? Depends what I was looking for, doesn't it? Because Paris is ambiguous. Yeah. Um, so I can narrow it down a bit. I can look for Paris Hilton. Yeah. I find the Hilton Hotel in Paris. And I find Paris Hilton, social or model, or whatever she is. Um, how they found what I was looking for? You don't know because you don't know what those combinations of, of letters Paris and Hilton meant. Yeah? It depends on the context of it because it's still ambiguous. Yeah. Um, words are language specific, so if I'd have searched for um, Paris in a different language, I'd have actually got different results there. So the alternative to doing that and to solve some of these other problems I've talked about is using a concept-based approach, a sort of knowledge graph approach, rather than trying to use words to describe these things. Um, so we can remove that ambiguity here in this little instance, uh, made up model. We have um, entities linked by, by uh, properties or links, We've kind of seen this thing before, uh, where we have an entity which has a few different labels, all meaning Paris, which is an instance of a city, um, and we have uh, Paris Hilton, which is the hotel, and Paris Hilton, which is the person. They're two different things, and so we can um, reference the two different things unambiguously and talk about them. So our search isn't going to find the person, yeah, and the data record is going to refer to the person. Yeah. Um, I mentioned. Uh, at the start, uh, well, the title of the original talk was the Data Integration Case Study. This was something we did um, as part of the Ariadne project. Um, it took extracts from five archaeological data sets, plus some output from some natural language processing applied to some great literature reports. Uh, we wanted it to be multilingual, so we took data from English, Dutch, and Swedish uh, data sets. Um, so there's some stats on the number of objects and, and records we, we extracted. We used this knowledge graph structure approach and transformed the data into RDF using a subset of the C. conceptual reference model with references to Getty, Art and Architecture, the Solus concepts. And we aggregated all that data to a triple store and then created a little query over to search across it. As a general sort of architecture and workflow, I'm running out of time, so I won't go through it in too much detail. Um, but essentially, we took all of this data and transformed it put it on a common platform and create a little uh, uh, query builder demonstrator for the front end so you didn't have to deal with the Sparkle directly. So there it is. Uh, so uh, just, just to be able to, for an example, as I'm showing here, searching on a data span requires all of that data cleansing in the background, the interpretation, the modeling, and um, integration of those data spans um, into a common uh, System. If you want to know more about that, we've written a little paper about it on the Journal of Information Science. There, there's the, the um, reference to it, and there's also a link to the online demonstrator. And you can, there's a bit of a description about it, and you can try it out. It's not a great user interface, but it's really there just to demonstrate the, the principles of what you can do once you've got this data into more structured form and integrate it onto a common platform. And that's it for me. Thank you.